Welcome to Death and Aliens, an in-depth look at horror and sci-fi TV from two friends who vaguely know what they're doing. I'm MK. And I'm Courtney. And Courtney, how are you today? You know, I am... Or should I say, where are you today? (laughs) Where am I today? So, surprisingly, I am in New Jersey, and when you hear this, I will be in New Jersey still for, like... Actually, I'll be in New York, but I'll be close enough for, like, (laughs) five hours. I have a 7 a.m. flight today when this comes out um, to head back to New Orleans. So I am currently in New Jersey. I got here two days ago um, and I am surprisingly well rested because I slept 15 hours every night after getting back from Nashville, which was incredible. It was, I like Nashville to visit. I don't want to live there which means I'll probably live there at some point, but right. I, uh, <laughs> because you've said that about everywhere, everywhere I've ever lived. I'm like, never. And then I live there. So it's fine. Um, but this was my first, I went to music biz conference and this was my first conference to go like as myself and not like as someone else's company. Um, and so it was just kind of like exciting and like, you know, I don't know. It, it was, it was fun. I started making my own connections and like, I, I met all these really great people. I did a lot of networking. Um, I got to go visit the Sirius XM offices, nice. um, which was really fun. And everyone who worked there is just incredible. Um, because my my friend Forbes, who I'm sure I mentioned, he manages my friend Brett Altman in New York. He works for the Pandora side. And so we mm, got to okay. go visit the Sirius offices. So that was his- just cut out. Oh, nope. Oh, it didn't. Ah. Mine did. Mm. Hello? Hello. You sound weird, so something disconnected and reconnected weirdly. But I don't know what or how. All right, can you hear me? Yes, you sounded weird for a second too. Yeah, so my whole sense. my whole system just popped out and I was like Excellent. Okay. Great. Yeah. So I saw some amazing performances. Um I got to see, um, I know I talked about them before, but Lonesome Joy, I, I had seen them at the bitter end mm-hmm. like a month and a half back. I got to see them in Nashville, nice. in their hometown, which was very fun. Um, and so I got to see, you know, my friend Ryan, who I, I now know and I've seen a couple of times. So now I think nice. we're friends. Um, but yeah, and so Caitlin got to perform her first show in Nashville. Um, she ended up playing on the stage at Tootsie's one day. Like right. it was such a wild week and had the best time i got to see some really good friends i never see aaron from did you ever know aaron white have i asked you this a million times he worked at disney for a while he worked at the starbucks he did a lot of um what's the word hospitality stuff but he was there for like a year and a half yeah i don't know that i have paths ever crossed so he's aaron takini now but he was aaron white at the time when you would have known him so we we went to college together and um he's the one who got me into the conference he's amazing sorry to see him and his husband i got to see olivia francis who's a great artist out in nashville check her out she's also got really fun tiktoks if if you're interested um but yeah it was just a very enlightening week and it's it set me off on some different um business ventures that i may break into soon so we'll talk about that off air because it's not anywhere near official yet (laughs) in the ether but but yeah it was it was like even better than I could have imagined. And I spent less than I thought, like than I budgeted for. So that's great. That's always a nice thing. So yeah, I'm just kind of like living life. We left right after Caitlin's show at, at midnight Thursday night and started driving back to New York. And so we left at midnight from Nashville and I got to Noel's house in Jersey at 4 30 PM. And I'd had two hours of sleep in the car since, you know, 11 AM the day before. Yeah. And so I uh, I got in, I dropped my bags, no one else was here, I laid down, I fell asleep, and I woke up at 10.30 the next day. So, right. well rested now, oh, sleeping like a normal person again. Good, 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 good. But how are you? I had a very interesting week as well. Um, I... I just feel like uh, so many things happened that I like don't even know what to talk about. Uh, <laughs> um, no, but I worked because I worked a couple shifts at Shays where um, we we're doing once, which I is, still haven't seen that. It's my favorite musical, so I've gotten to listen to once like every day for the last two weeks, which has been so wonderful. 
Um, Dan had a concert. I listened to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which is also wonderful. The best. Yeah. So good. Um, one of my friends who um, I work with at St. Andrews, but he um, is like, he went to school for conducting. He's the music teacher at my school, but he mm-hmm. is a professional like conductor and everything. Um, he, I, I, and we were both at the concert at the same time, but not sitting together. And at the end of the show, he goes, did you make it? Because he knows that I have a really hard time with orchestral concerts because they're always at night and I am not, I'm not a Awake night person. Night. I'm not, a, I'm not a night person. I'm also not a morning person. I'm like a hit me at three o'clock in the afternoon and I will do everything kind of person. Mm. But like, but like, if you need me to stay up late or wake up early, both of them are not going to work for me. <laughs> uh, I'm the opposite of you. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Um. So, but there's always the like second to last movement of these orchestra pieces is always this really long, mm-hmm. slow movement. And last year, I don't remember what symphony they did, but I fell asleep <laughs> during one of the movements. And in Beethoven's Ninth, the slow movement is very slow. And so, uh-huh. <laughs> so Mason and Brad were like, did you do it? Did you stay awake? And I was like, yes, but it was only because the guy sitting next to me was like a hundred years old and was conducting the whole time he was sitting next to me. And so, and everyone sitting around me was like really old and really judgy. And when you are seeing an orchestra piece, there are multiple movements, but you don't clap between movements. You're only supposed to clap at the end of the Mm -hmm. piece. But most people who don't have any education in classical music don't know this. Right. So like when you go to like a big orchestra house, people are clapping. Go ahead. You're fine. Sorry. sorry. You you just said, Oh, Um, people are clapping. And everyone that was sitting in the row with me, mind you, we were in the last row. These were the cheapest tickets in the house. This was not like good prime. I belong in the orchestra seats. They were all like staring at everyone who was clapping. And I was like, Karen, go home. Bless their hearts. Yeah, that is something, um, a learning curve for a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. The, the other thing that is a learning curve for orchestra, and this one, I don't think they're correct. I would like to fight all of them. I understand not clapping till the end of a, of a movement. Because, like, if you think about it, if there's, like, a long pause in a song in a musical and people start clapping, it's fucking awkward. So, like, I get it why you only clap at the end of a piece, not a movement. But at the end yeah. of a musical... Everybody comes out on stage. They each take their turn bowing. You clap for them. They point to the orchestra. You clap for them. Everybody bows one more time. They leave. It usually takes a while because there are different people bowing every time. But nobody bows 52 times. No. No. In the orchestra, the conductor and the soloists bow. Then they leave the stage. Then they come back on and then they bow and then they leave the stage and then they come back on and then they bow and then the orchestra stands up and then you can clap for the orchestra and then they leave and then the conductor for the chorus comes on and then they clap and then the chorus stands up and then the soloist and the conductors come back on and it's like just clap or bow and then stand there and then when the clapping's done leave. Why why do you leave and come back and leave and come back and leave and come back? You're not that good. Right. No. (laughs) No one asked for an encore. No one asked for an encore. But that is, my God, that is the standard when I played in orchestras. It is like, it is, no, and it's, it, stance it, 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 leave, and it go, is, leave. And I'm like, oh and God. it's normal. And I mean, between between my own work in the opera world yeah. and obviously being with Jan, who mm. sings professionally, I have been to my fair share of classical concerts. And I will never understand that one. Mm-mm. 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 No. I will say when you're talking about the third movement, like I have been in a lot of orchestras and that was always my scariest movement. It is the easiest to play note wise, you know, sight rate, memorize, but I, I play clarinet. And so I always had to play the long drawn out high notes and I am very good at them until you put me in front of people because then I panic. 
I have the worst stage fright. And so every concert, and I would always have the solo. So I always had the solo, which was even worse. And it's like, everyone's like, this is such an easy part. I'm like, sure, theoretically, but do you know how steady you have to keep your like breathing and your like amateur and everything yeah. to not squeak on stage or not to like go out of tune when you're playing like a really long note or a really high note. And uh, it brought me like just you saying that brought anxiety back to me. And I have not played in an orchestra in nine years. I don't know. It's been a minute. Yeah. But it's okay. Oh God. I understand that because the anxiety came back to me. Dan pulled out his sheet music for the graduation he had to sing at yesterday. And um, one of the songs was a song that I had to do a solo in for my it, one of my middle school chorus concerts and immediately started sweating. Just looked at the sheet music and immediately started sweating. And I was like, yep. Thank God I am not. And all of the people in his chorus are like, you should join. You should join the chorus. No, no, thank you. I love music. I I do not want my relationship to music to be once again dictated by someone else's performance standards. Like that is a that is a thing that I can't handle, which is why I don't professionally act anymore either. Like I don't mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I am. I am very happy and thankful to be working in a ton of different aspects of music. Very glad performance is not one of them. Correct. I love. Very glad that's not. One I of them. love that I teach drama. I love that I work in a theater. I love that I am a chorus wife. So I'm at all of these shows and I'm learning all the music right. with them. And I never have to have anyone hear me sing unless I want them to. Yeah. Yeah, Caitlin didn't know I played clarinet for twelve years. Somehow that has never come up. Um, I guess I don't lead with that a lot, but. <laughs> It didn't come up and I mentioned it while we were in Nashville and she just looked at me and she was like, why aren't you in my band? And I was like, none of us want that. No, I guarantee you, none of us want that. She's like, what do you mean? I was like, because I was like, I played for 12 years and I'm done. Actually, like, you played for 12 years and you, you don't know. Like, no, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. No, no, you're doing great. I'm going to take pictures and videos. You stay over there. Correct. So yeah. Good times. Uh, yeah. Um, other things oh no I was just gonna transition right into the uh episode I had like a really good um like segue and then I realized that I was segueing to the wrong thing so now I don't have a segue so I'm just gonna ask you for a quote <laughs> you got it you <laughs> got it um so I know so this is a little dark but it's my last one this is my last quote that i pulled out of the darkness and then i'll okay. have to start pulling new quotes so good, stay good, tuned good. um i know you thought the breaking wasn't the most painful chapter it wasn't turn the page the next part is much longer it's the healing the rise the comeback it's the birth of the new you and it's not easy but you are strong and brave and worth it I stephanie bennett henry love that love that so much all right so today speaking of the healing and the getting over the darkness today are we, are we over it yet fine. Go ahead. Um, sorry go ahead <laughs> no it's it's fine because i was watching this episode yesterday and um about five minutes into the episode something really big happens and mom goes i don't remember that and i go yeah well Courtney's not gonna be really happy about it. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, because both you and Dan had the same reaction to Daniel dying, was that it's fine because Michael Shanks still is the voice of Thor. And then this episode happens and they go. <laughs> this whole time. The whole time this episode, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Well, because Michael Shanks wanted out she i was, uh, get it <laughs> i get it <laughs> i'm just not pleased and i thought i had an easier out so today we are talking about the season finale of season five um i do have a lot of trivia for this episode but some of it i don't i'm not going to give you all of the details in the trivia because it's a lot of what i want to talk about for the season wrap up next week um because it has to do with the way season five ended and season six and it's all the production stuff that gets into that but this is so this is started SG1 season five episode 22 revelations 
It was rated 8.4 stars. And it came out on May 17th, 2002. It is a good episode for all of the anger it brings me. It is actually a good episode. Yeah. So 8.4 yeah. feels fine. Yeah. And the, the anger it brings you is more because I have been lying to you for weeks. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So there's that. Um, but in terms of the story, it's actually really good. Right. Right. Um, and it's a better send off for Thor than Daniel got. <laughs> but it's still open-ended it's I mean, still very ambiguous it is also still very ambiguous yeah. um but so uh the number one song was still foolish apparently ashanti was ruling 2002 um she was i know you seem to have not been there in 2002 yeah i don't know what happened i don't know what was. happened because i did not ever hear this song mm -hmm. um but i'm trying to think in 2002 in may of 2002 i was in fourth grade so i don't think i was listening to pop music like at all i had older cousins yeah i um i didn't my favorite i've talked about this on the podcast before that my favorite singer up until like the age of like 12 was the big bopper yeah. and like chubby checker so like i um i don't think i knew what was happening in the real music world at this time um the number one book is also a book I've never heard of, but it, I'm a little fascinated by it. Um, okay. I looked it up. It's called The Shelters of Stone by Jean mm -hmm. M. All, I think. It's A-U-E-L. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, but it's the second book in a series called Earth's Children. And it's a historical fiction series, but it's actually not historical fiction. It's prehistoric fiction. And, like, it takes place in the upper Paleolithic era in Europe before, like, and it's wild. And there's six okay. books. There's six books. And there are these, like, teenagers in prehistoric Europe. Interesting. That does sound up your alley. I yeah. Probably won't read that, but it does sound very much up your alley. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's good. I mean, it must have been sort of good. It was the New York Times bestseller. Yeah. But then again, that doesn't mean anything because, like, James Patterson's on the bestseller list all the time, and I'm not really a huge fan of his work. So I like his early stuff, and I like very specific series of his. Yeah, but it's now just he not, doesn't write his own books anymore. So yeah, it's just not it's just my cup of tea. So like, yeah. I mean, I'd rather. But yeah, but this this weird prehistoric dinosaur people thing is totally my cup of tea. So very um, much so. And then the number one movie is also a new movie from last week. Uh, last week we were still living with Spider-Man, but a new movie came out this week. Um, and so the number one movie is uh, Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. That came out in 2002? It sure did. I, wanna, I feel like every Star Wars movie came out in 1983. Like, I understand that that yeah. is not how that works, so but... I explained, I was talking to my mom recently about the prequels and how bad they are. Um, Go ahead. And I, and how they're not good. And I was like, yeah, but I, I don't know why. Like, I can't help that I love them. Like, I, and she was just like making fun of it because they're so bad. And I was like, you have to understand, mom. I was like, but they have Ewan McGregor and mm -hmm. like, the, and and she was like, yes, but also they have Hayden Christensen. And I go, okay, leave Hayden Christensen alone. Like, I will forever, Chris, call, uh, what's that kid's name? Chris, who cried uh -huh. about Britney Spears. Britney? I will forever uh -huh. cry, Britney Spears cry about Hayden Christensen getting bullied out of the acting industry because terrible directors made him do terrible acting choices. He was a kid who didn't know what he was doing, and he had terrible direction. That's so funny. But I... I pulled out this, I got this scarf at this barcade we went to, and it's all 80s stuff, and I thought Star Wars was on here, but it seems it is not. Well, <laughs> it seems the, it is not on here. The first Star Wars movie came out in 1977, so not in the 80s. Um, yeah, but that's when it was like, I feel like that was like a really big hype for it, though. Like, probably it was, it was because, wrapped into the 80s culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I thought um, it would be on our 80s culture. I don't know. Like, like Pokemon Ball is on here. That feels not 80s. That feels it does 90s. feel not 80s, but I don't I don't Batman. trust your barcade. No, it's Pac it's Pac-Man and Rubik's Cube too. Those were 80s, right? Those were like hard 80s. 
Because yeah. there's also gremlins on here. Yeah. Eight but ball. When, but when magic did eight Pokemon ball. come out? I mean, Pokemon came out before the 90s, but it didn't get popular in the U.S. till the 90s. Mm. That was a failure. No. Sorry for a, my show the and date, tell. The date of introduction of Pokemon was 1996. I'm not wrong. Yeah, that's that was for the U.S., right? I think it was out before then. Japan. Let me see. Nope. No? No. The, orig- oh. the original work, Pocket Monster is Red, was 1996. I know Pokemon was not in the 90s <laughs> or in the 80s. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't think it was in the 80s, especially here, but but then mm-hmm. it has like Gremlins is 1984. Like it's definitely it's probably okay, just it's arcade culture. It's just video game arcade culture, not pop culture. That's what it is. With the Rubik's Cube. Yeah, because it's an arc- it's a game. Yes, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, but so the first Star Wars movie came out in 1977. Yeah. My mom was nine. That I did know. My mom was nine. The first prequel movie came out in 2001. I was nine. Mm. So I was like, you have to understand that my connection to the prequel and the way I feel about Jar Jar Banks, even though I know that it isn't good, is because right. this was my Star Wars. Like, this was... Like, yes, I had seen the original trilogy when I was younger, but, like, this was the first time I got to go to the movie theaters and see Star Wars. Um, And I said, plus, the most iconic line of the entire series comes, of the entire Star Wars, from beginning to end, comes from episode two. And she just looked at me like I was completely out of my mind. And I just looked her dead in the face and said, I don't like Sam. (laughs) <laughs> i was like what are you about to say <laughs> she was like, Fuck off. see i have a very skewed idea of how of when it came out because i didn't watch it to law school mm, so like okay. i felt like th- i knew i knew the order and i knew the first one yeah and then i missed what year the rest of them released until what the ones that came out while i was in law school like those i got because i was yeah. there for that right but no, I don't remember exactly the year that episode three came out, but I know it's the same year that Batman Begins came out because I watched a double feature in the drive through of those two movies and cried over Mace Windu's death in a way that was not normal for a preteen. So probably not normal for anyone, but that's fine. Also fair. Um, but yeah, so... Also, I could not find any news. Um, There was, like, a bunch of people I'd never heard of died, and there was a tornado in Texas, but I feel like that's, like, an everyday occurrence because it wasn't, like, a big tornado. So I was like, all right, cool. Nothing happened that day. Great. Um, For the best. Yeah. And the director of this episode was Martin Wood. It was written by Joseph Molossi and Paul Molly and edited by Adam, or Adam, Alan Lee. Mm -hmm. Um, Our guest star is David Pulfey. Who plays Anubis? Um, we don't see his face, but yep, I was trying to picture a face, and then you said Anubis. I was like, nope, that's not yeah. one. Yeah. That's not a face. Um, he's known for Stargate SG One, Blade the series, um, Cold Squad, and Full Metal Jacket. Um, he went to Harvard and the University of Calgary to study law, um, and then left to go to RADA to study acting. What is Rada? Rada? Rada, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. It's like the big acronym gotcha. in London. Yes. Yeah. I have heard of it when you don't use an acronym. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> but I'm sure everyone else in the world knows the acronym. So. Um, so he was so poor in acting school that he lived on a Dutch barge. Like he lived on a boat in the canal oh, in um, not by choice. Um, mm-hmm. and t- in London until Full Metal Jacket. Once he was in, once he was cast in that movie, he finally had enough money to like survive. Um sure. He has three sons. Um, he was married to Erica Durant. Um, who, she played Lois Lane in Smallville. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, they were, were married in 2005, um, but they and they actually just last April announced their separation. Mm-hmm. Um, Bummer. But it's also like really weirdly hush hush. Like they made a joint announcement, and then now they then they took all mention of each other off of all of their social media, and like only have pictures of their kids, but like no mention of each other existing. 
Um, it's very weird. Um, I don't understand. Um, but you do actually know what his face looks like because he was already in Stargate as Sokar. Now I need to look up his face. Um, yeah. Sokar was such a big, big bad that we didn't really actually have a lot of big badness for, and he died so quickly that they used David and Anubis as a character that you don't see his face necessarily um, with the way he cloaks himself. So they um, uh, yeah. they had David Palfi um, come back. Come back, yes. Cool, cool, um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I... Okay, those are all my notes for the end. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, because I do all my pre-watching notes first because it's not like I'm spoiling myself with trivia because I know it. So I just had to go, okay, where do I stop? Do the real the notes thing, Do the yeah. actual notes of the episode start. Okay, so we... um. Um, previously on have clips from two different episodes um just a quick recap that we do that um remind us that we introduced anubis we haven't seen him and that remind us that daniel is dead in yes. case you forgot in case we forgot that's what i was about to say <laughs> um but we start the episode with osiris on uh, on her ship and thor appears to her and tells her that she's in violation of the treaty and that he will be forced to attack and she basically says oh well and he attacks her, but the shield actually holds. And she says that the Gold will no longer need to bow to the Asgard. And then we get the credits. Uh, Which is very uh, uplifting, you know. Mm -hmm. Um. After the credits, we start with a scene where Daniel, Sam is in Daniel's office, um, like, you know, just not handling herself very well, which I will say this, I did not put in the trivia for this episode, but a lot of trivia, like a lot of times when you try to read forum posts or blog posts or trivia posts about this episode, all of the comments talk about the fact that Sam clearly not equipped for the military. Because her reaction is not in line with what right. you know, how a military officer should handle a t like a team like you are obviously like Jack is clearly not okay mm -hmm. but he's pretending to be okay because that's what yeah. you do. Teal you can't let your emotions roll right. Like Teal has a moment where he like lets it out for a hot second, but he's a warrior. Sam is zero percent showing her ability to be in the military in this episode. And people, like, get real heated about it online. And I mm -hmm. understand that from a storytelling perspective, it doesn't make sense if none of them show sadness. Like, one of them That's has true. to be weaker because the story wouldn't work if they were all just like, okay, Daniel's dead, moving on. So like, make it the girl. So make it the girl, right? Which that's where my issue is. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's yeah. where my issue with it is. Is like, you really want to tell me that Sam, I mean, of all of the people who are emotionally attached to Jack or to Daniel, it should be Jack. Jack is the one Daniel appears to, to let him know that he's leaving. Jack is the one who's been there since day one. Jack is the one who's already lost a kid. Like, mm -hmm. and looks at Daniel like, like his new kid, like yeah. his new, his new older kid. Jack is the one who should be distraught, but Jack doesn't show emotion. So we can't write Jack to be distraught. So let's do the easy out and make Sam unable to handle herself. Sam handled herself better with her dad turning into a Tokra than she did with Daniel dying. Truly, it does not truly. make a fucking lick of sense. Yeah. I will say, to be fair, her and her dad were a bit estranged. Not yes. necessarily like estranged, estranged, but like a bit. Yeah. So maybe she did have a little less emotional involvement there with her and Daniel were every second, every day together. Right. Um, but yeah. So, but I mean still, she she is military, and I don't think she would have been this way, but I do understand that someone had to be. 
Yeah. So it's but like I think it should have been Jack. Um but so she's talking about how she doesn't know how she's supposed to cope. She doesn't know how she's supposed to move on. And then Hammond decides that he wants to ruin my life <laughs> by telling the most upsetting story ever. I literally paused it after Hammond's story and had to get up and walk a circle around the room because also part of it is full disclosure. It's my grandpa's birthday this week. Mm -hmm. And um, for those of you who don't know, my grandpa is a Vietnam vet who is facing mental health issues because of it. Um, so this fucked me up. Yeah. Um, but Hammond tells a story about losing a friend in Vietnam who he knows didn't die because he radioed that he landed after he was shot down but then he never radioed again he was captured the Vietnamese never released him or did release he knows nothing about what happened to this person after he landed and so he spent most of his adult life just thinking that one day he was going to walk through the door again and Sam was like what did you do and he was like I just learned to live with it Yeah. I hate it. I hate it here. Um, and then because, you know, they want us to feel everything at the same time while we're still fucked up about Hammond's best friend, um, the gate activates and the power lines go down and they head to the gate room and find that Freyer has wandered in and, um, and, apologizes for his absence and explains that like things are getting real bad with the replicator war. They don't really have a lot of hope. Um, but also he isn't there. And they were like, Oh, well, like you got our message about the Android, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, he was like, I did. And that's great. But I'm actually not here to talk about that. Um, Thor is dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's been missing for, you know, like 73 years now. And all of a sudden, they're just like, we're in the finale, so here you go. Thor's dead. It's fine. We just have to tell you. I was like, Courtney's going to be so mad at me. I was. I had to rewind this part, like, a few times because I was like, what is happening? Well, and then it, when when Sam walks into the gate room and immediately is like, oh, a frayer, I go, I do not understand for a second how they recognize them. <laughs> And my mom said, you can't say that. That's bigoted. I was like, mom, I'm not saying all Asian people look alike. I'm saying right. all of all of these animatronic <laughs> animatronic puppet aliens look identical. Then, haha, -ha, turns out you find out later in the episode that they're all clones. And I go, I'm not racist. They're clones. Yeah. Yep. Still does not explain how they can just look at them and know which one is which. Does not. Maybe it's her um, Joel and our feelings that it's like, this one is this one. Maybe they have name tags on that I can't fucking see. Maybe. I I'm so mad about it. Because I was, mom was like, you sound racist right now. I was like, they're little gray men, mom. I'm not. <laughs> I was like, when there's only one in the episode, it's easy to know which one it is. There's three of them in this episode. You're really going to tell mm -hmm. me? That they could tell all three apart. Yeah. Although I do think Freya is taller than Heimdall, but that's a different <laughs> possible, possible. Um so uh, he did not survive the battle with Osiris, um, but there was an Asgard scientist trapped in a lab on the base, and they need help with a rescue mission because the ship that Thor was on that blew up is the uh, last ship they had at their disposal. Yeah. And Jack just like jumps in and he's like, okay, we'll do it. That's what we do, right? Sam is pissed because Hammond has already told Sam that Jack's um, decision was that SG1 should just stay on active duty. And Sam doesn't think that that's fair um, and that they need time to mourn. Where the others are like, yeah, it's sad, but we. We do need to, this, what we're doing, it's not like we sell ice cream for a living. Like, what we're right. doing is important enough that while, yes, we need to mourn and take care of ourselves mentally and emotionally, our jobs don't stop. 
Yeah. And also you have to think about like, sometimes if you like, sure, you need a minute to mourn, but at the same time in this type of job, if you take too long, then it could also cause the trauma of like being too nervous to jump back in Mm -hmm. and, you know, so you don't want to end up in the opposite problem. Well, and Um, also you think about some people don't cope well with doing mm -hmm. nothing. Like, look at the difference in Jack's personality from episode one to now. When episode one, he was in retirement because he retired after his son died and he did not have any idea how to cope. And he just sat around doing nothing. Yeah. Jack is not the kind of person who can cope by taking a step back. He will not heal. He has to keep going. Yeah. So he's not pushing forward because he doesn't care. He's pushing forward because he does. And that's what you have to do. Right. You're all right there. You're, you're moving I'm trying around very quietly to open my pretzels. <laughs> I was like, you're <laughs> moving around a lot. Um, and then I realized there were scissors, so I'm, oh, I had to smart. go the other direction. Smart. I'm fine. Um, and I'm Sam, Sam, like, <laughs> she's like, why are you acting like nothing happened? And he's like, it's the job. That's what we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, they fly out. And the scene of them flying out is one of the most awful, like, awkward, insane the scenes it's all very somber and jack is just like slowly putting a gun together like he'd rather be anywhere but there and sam and teal are just staring out the window it's like the most awkward thing i've ever seen yeah it's like the car ride when it's just you and your parents and they just got into a fight and then it's just like, you <laughs> sitting there in the back seat with your parents and no one is speaking to each other that's a hundred percent a hundred percent how that is um so Sam and Teal ha- have a little talk about it. And he is like telling her that like, this is something we should be proud of. Like he moved on to a higher plane of existence. That's what all warriors want. Like, and she's like, okay, but like, I would rather not be proud of him and have him here. And then you just get a close up of Teal crying. And he's like, so, I know. Oh. So would I, like, I, I mean, t- I feel that way too, but. Ugh so many of got me yeah you know sorry i took my allergy medicine but it's so hot in my house that i have all the windows open and my neighbors are all cutting their grass today so it's like good time good time great which i mean i get it it's beautiful out cut your grass i'm all for it also that means there's so much grass in the air (laughs) dying yeah I um we have windows open everywhere, so I'm waiting, waiting to see how that's gonna turn out for me. But I did take my allergy medicine, so fingers crossed. Right. Ugh. Um, um, so they then they drop out of hyperspace and there's a brief moment when they can when before they can cloak, but like no one seems to be shooting at them. Everything seems to be going fine. They go through um and they go through the atmosphere of the planet, and this scene was really unnecessary for the plot. It was just, like, nice to, like, remind us that these three people don't hate each other. (laughs) Um, Because they're, like, driving through, and it's, like, really bumpy. And Jack's just, like, falling over in the back. And he's like, we should really think about putting a third seat back here. (laughs) I feel like, like, it's funny every time, but this scene is in every, like, space show. Yes. Every time. Yes. But it's still funny every time. I don't, because, I don't because know. Every, every time they do it, they handle it just slightly differently. And yeah. it, like, fits those characters. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they, like, get there. And they're like, oh, we, we've landed, but we don't really know what to do. Because we're at the coordinates. But there is no laboratory here. And they find out um, that the atmosphere is 80% carbon dioxide. And the planet's surface temperature is 420 degrees Fahrenheit. Jack just goes, ooh, hot. Just a little toasty. <laughs> a little toasty. Um, but they're so they're while they're questioning what to do, um, they're just beamed up, out of the ship because that's what the Asgard do. Um, and they meet Heimdall and exchange pleasantries, and there's um, ah, humans. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that was my favorite. <laughs> they're like, ah, humans. 
And then he goes, uh, he's like, okay. And they introduce themselves and he's like, oh, okay. I know who you are. I've heard all about you. That means I'm only missing one. Where's Dr. Jackson? And then they have this like awkward moment and I go, and you just go, is this entire episode just going to be awkward moments of Daniel being gone? Like, is that what we're doing yes. right now? Yes, it is. Uh, uh, it only happens one other time. One time too many. <laughs> um, But... Then we flash back to the mothership and the ghoul know that the, or no, we're still there. Just kidding. This is not the time that the ghoul will talk about it. Heimdall tells them that the ghoul know that they're there, but they don't know where mm-hmm. the lab is. Um, and she wants like, okay, great. Like, let's get out of here. And Heimdall's like, we can't leave. And they're like, <laughs> but why? And he's like, well, because Thor isn't dead. He's, he's on the ghoul ship. The best place for him to be, right. as you can imagine. Great. Um, so, did they ever say how long he had been there? And I missed it. No. Okay. Basically, I was wondering. Basically, he's only been there the amount of time it's taken Freyer to contact SG One and SG One to get there. So, okay, I wasn't sure if it was like from the time we lost contact with the Asgards until now. No, 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 no. Remember, Thor is the one who told Osiris at the beginning to, um, sorry, I dropped my pen. Thor is the one who told Osiris at the beginning that they needed to leave. And then you saw him shooting her ship. And then, so that was like the same day that all of this is happening. It's Got not, it. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if that was like before or if it was now or whatever. No, no, no. It's, Thor is on the only expendable ship and um, had to go police the violations of the treaty. Yeah. Um, so then we go up to the ship and Osiris has Thor prisoner and she's like, and he's like, you violated the treaty and now you've attacked me. There will be retribution for this. And she like scoffs at his ideas that they can do anything. She's like, whatever. I'm so much better I know. than you. She is. She is. <laughs> <laughs> we're both like she is she is like so cocky yeah but like and i get like i get she's osiris i get but my god she just like blew on the scene and was like i've been gone for three thousand years it's fine i'm back now like yeah, she is <laughs> she's a bitch like she, there's no other way to describe it she is cocky she is callous she is mm-hmm. like it, she's a bitch like i'm like that yeah. she is one of my least favorite cool like system lord god things yeah but she's just not even like they're redeemable not, no nothing yeah and like you want to feel bad because it's sarah but she also was kind of a bitch. Like, super great like yeah. you know like, she you broke know, daniel's like, heart so uh, yeah. and then wasn't super nice about it before she became osiris like right so but yeah. then again we also don't know it, it's pretty we don't know for sure but it, it makes oh. a lot of sense that she was actually osiris for that entire episode where we saw that's her. true that's so, true. like the last time that she like was around daniel not infected was when she before broke us. up with him in college yeah. before we saw him or saw her. that makes sense so like she we've only ever seen osiris sarah who is a bitch but also mm-hmm. she broke daniel's heart in college so she probably wasn't that nice anyway right yeah i mean how do you break daniel's heart i mean come on to be fair all you have to do is be a woman and slightly well, flirt with him and then yeah. do anything else that isn't still flirting with him and you've broken daniel's heart um, yeah but they were together for like a hot minute yeah and like he's daniel he is for all of his other he, faults, okay, he's the most loving person on the planet yeah, like, i would have he fell in love with the destroyer of worlds the minute after his wife died like let's let's remember she was this very is charming. daniel <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> yeah so uh, <laughs> back in the lab heindel explains that his sensors can see through the gold shields he can track like bio signatures and like the layout of the ship but his transport device doesn't work through the shields like certain frequencies work and certain don't so he can see where thor is he can know that thor is still alive but he can't get thor out and he's like thor is likely being tortured for information so we we need to get him out so that what he knows doesn't get to the world. Um, 
We flash back to Osiris telling Thor that Anubis himself is on the way to interrogate Thor. Uh oh. Hmm. That's not a good sign. Um, <clears throat> so Jack's like, Do you have a way that I could talk to Thor? Like, you can't beam him out, but can you talk to him? So they use the hollow pad and send hologram Jack to talk to Thor. And Thor's like, you have to leave me behind. Like you need to get out of here because um, you need to save Heimdall because the stuff he's working on in the lab is the future of the Asgard. Like everything depends on Heimdall getting out of there safely. Um, and he's like, you, you can't stay because Anubis is coming. I just, and I'm very nervous about him. The thing that I want to explain to Sam, like if I was a person in the show, not a person watching the if show. If you were a person. Yes, if I was a person. But no, if I was a person in the show, not a person mm -hmm. watching the show, I would explain to Sam that if she thinks that Jack doesn't care about Daniel, she needs to, for one second, look at the risk that he is willing to take for Thor. Like, this yeah. is the kind of person Jack is. Jack cares so deeply that he will make every stupid decision that goes against his training as a military officer and his experience as a prisoner of war to save the people he loves. What he isn't going to do is sit back and let other people get hurt because he's sad about it. He yep. can't mourn Daniel because look what that could have done to Thor and Heimdall. Like, that's not who he is. But everything that he's doing to save Thor proves how much he cared. Mm -hmm. And I just want to yeah. get into Sam's knucklehead. I know. <sighs> she, like, they, and I think, I touching on at the beginning, I think that she knows that as a character. I think it was just a device because, you know, they wanted this discrepancy. But I think that, like, removed from the idea of being in a tv show that sam's character would have understood that too and i also know? think i also saw something one of the producers said in an interview that sam isn't angry at jack she's just angry with jack which is a different thing because mm -hmm. she like if you remove her emotions from the situation she could probably also tell you everything i just said yeah but she's not in a place to process that right now because she can't, she even tells Hammond, I don't know how I'm feeling. So I don't know how you can know how I'm feeling because I don't know what it is. She has never dealt with a loss quite this big before, which also doesn't make sense because her mom died. Yeah. So yeah, again, she maybe wrote. she wasn't as close with her mom we didn't hear like a ton about it we didn't but we do know that the reason she stopped talking to her dad was because her mom right. died so she must have been pretty close to her mom mm -hmm. um i think that this is just kind of plot holy of like we need somebody to be processing the emotions and so yeah. sam is the sam is the character that it's easiest to write emotional for because amanda is yeah. the actor who is easiest who can do it like it wouldn't Chris and Rick couldn't do it as believably as Amanda could. So Sam's character had to be the one to do it. And also, if you think about it, like, while Sam's character, like, is the best at it, she's also going to be the one that's the most yes. rational about it. And mm -hmm. so even when we have some irrational, quote unquote, irrational moments where we're like, she's a little too emotional about this. Like, if you gave it to Jack, he probably would be even more emotional about it. If you gave it to mm -hmm. Tilk, he wouldn't. Right at all because like, that's what's in his character. Sam He's so stoic. Sam is the only one who can be like, I am upset and don't want to be here and feel like I'm going to cry at any minute and will still solve the puzzle. Like that's yeah. that's her character. And so like I get the choices. I just think that there is a. It's one of those things where if the show was written in a streaming age 10 episode season everything connected people constantly critiquing every decision you make about a character there's some characters yeah. threads that don't quite tie together the way you could get away with in 2000s because the person that this should have gone to was daniel jackson yeah no the character who, the character <laughs> who would the character who could believably be that upset about somebody dying and nobody caring is daniel he's the only yeah. one He's the only one. Sorry, I'm wearing a bathing suit because it's too hot to wear, like, real clothes. But the strap came untied. 
And I don't want to like. I did not know where that came from. I was like, what is happening? Like, what is clothes? happening? No, I realized that like my bathing suit was coming off and I didn't want to like flash a titty on camera. That just felt like yeah. not, not the vibe. Let's put like an extra like explicit warning on the internet, so. <laughs> um i don't really know how that works you well you do that part so i don't really know how that works but <laughs> be weird be some like weird cropping on the video um so uh jack gets off the hollow pad and asks heimdall why thor is so worried about them getting him out of here and he's like and then he <laughs> this scene is great because he explains everything he's doing and then sam explains it to jack <laughs> um AKA to the audience. Yep. Um, yep. And so basically his research is in cellular mitosis on the Asgard because their entire race are clones. But mm -hmm. due to years of cloning and genetic breakdown, the Asgard race is like actually dying out. They don't really have the genetic material to keep cloning themselves. And with the way the replicators have taken control of their galaxy, they don't have the numbers to sustain their race. Right. So, like, this is kind of, like, the biggest deal. Yeah. Um, uh, Osiris, back in um, being a bitch and not caring about anybody else's feelings land, um, sends one of her Jaffa to fly to the surface to find the lab, despite the very dangerous conditions of the surface. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, we can't find the coordinates via satellite. She's like, then go down there. I don't understand. So our, our team in the lab devise a plan to beam aboard the ship um, at using the rings on the cargo ship to, at the same time as Anubis does while they've changed the shield, because like, they have to change the frequency of the shields for Anubis to ring down. So then they'll ring up at the same time, but then they'll be trapped on it, the, on the ship. So then they'll have to turn the shields off from the inside, but they work out this whole plan and decide that Sam will stay with Heimdall so that she can read the maps and give advice to Teal'c and Jack while they're on the ship so that Heimdall can prep all of his stuff that he needs to take with him to move. So they're doing mm -hmm. three things at once. Yep. Um, Anubis drops on hyperspace, so they get ready, and they use their window of opportunity to enter the ship as, and as suspected, which they thought was going to happen, the world immediately are aware that there was an unauthorized transportation onto the ship. So the Jaffa begin searching for them and Sam gives them directions as they're navigating the ship. Um, and Anubis walks by and this is the first time we see him and he gives Emperor Palpatine vibes. He is very... I was just about to say, <laughs> speaking of Star Wars. <laughs> yes, he... Uh, which is funny because um, this came out the same day as episode two. So like it, it's er, right. great. Yeah. So very, very Emperor Palpatine vibes with yeah. his robe and everything. Um, and the and he's surrounded by an entourage. Um, suddenly, while this is happening, Jack and Teal'c are surrounded by Jaffa on all sides with no way out. So Heimdall suge suggests a diversionary tactic. Um, and Carter appears as a hologram and, like, waves at the Jaffa. Um, <laughs> this was the funniest part. I don't know why this was so funny in the episode like, every time. Hey, she guys! <laughs> and she it's... was like... <laughs> and so then Jack and Teal can take the Jaffa out from behind while they're shooting at the hologram that they can't do anything right. to because it's a hologram. Um, and then they take the advantage. This part cracked me up because Sam's like, okay, clear path ahead. And then Jack and Teal, despite the fact that this hallway is big enough for three across, we saw the Jaffa patrols. The hallway is wide enough for multiple people to go across. They both awkwardly walk through the hologram of Sam to keep walking. And I don't know why that was a choice that was made. And like, also, why didn't she step off the helipad? Like, she right. was done. She finished what she was doing. No one made a decision in that moment. No, none of that made any sense. Um, and Anubis goes to Thor, and Thor's like, "You'll never break me." Basically, mm -hmm. I just pictured this like Lord Farquaad and the Gingerbread Man and Shrek. I don't know why. <laughs> um, and he's like, "You'll never break me," and he's <sighs> like, "He's like, I don't need to break you because I'm gonna stick this." thing in your brain 
and it's going to connect your brain to the mothership and then download everything in your brain to our computer. God, and, what a what a technology. Right. And Thor's like, the ghoul don't have that kind of technology. And he's like, fucking bet we do. Yeah. Bet. <laughs> That's like my literally my note just says, but Anubis is all bet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> literally what my note says. Um Anubis is a, a new new kind of Anubis. Kinda leader. <laughs> yeah, he's like he's like, fuck what you thought you knew. Yeah. Um so then the Jaffa guy this poor jaffa guy i don't know what his name is um but i feel very bad for him the assistant Uh guy yeah like Mm -hmm. like osiris's first crime what a terrible job (laughs) oh my god because she doesn't care about anyone so he comes and tells osiris that the intruders have breached security and she's like how and he's like well they attacked our patrols and she's like fine just flood the lower decks with coolant from the hyperspace drive and he's like, that is toxic. And she's like, oh, only if you're exposed to it for a long time. And he's like, what about the Jaffa working in the engine room? And she doesn't give a single fuck. Zero no fucks are given. That. Not a one. She's like, Not they'll one. she's like, they'll have died for the cause. For the call, for your call. This is not like a life or death situation. Right. This is not more. This is not the glory of right. battle. This is your bitch. Yeah, um, literally, like, she made it sound like if this doesn't happen, the whole world ends. No, literally, if this doesn't happen, nothing happens. Like, maybe they get through, and then you kill them. Like, there are three people. Well, two, two people, there because two. Sam's a hologram. Yeah. There are two people. <laughs> there are two people in a hologram, and you're gonna kill <laughs> six All of Jaffa. Jaffa. Six, like, there were six in the engine yeah. room. So, six Jaffa who you don't seem to me to have replaceable staff here yeah also we learned that the ghoul population is diminishing because y'all fuckers are eating other ghouls right no no work work smarter not harder so the gas releases teal and jack and all the jaffa pass out and they're taken to a holding cell and Sam is trying to figure out what to do to rescue them. And Heimdall finally takes this moment to tell her what exactly it is that he is protecting in the lab. Because she's like, we got to figure it out. And he's like, we can't risk getting caught. She's like, but why? Y'all keep saying that. And he's like, here is my cryogenically frozen ancestor whose genetic tissue may lead us to be able to understand what is happening what a wild time that that reveal i was just like what is going on anymore like also, we're in the finale we have a cryogenically also frozen also the fact that the cryogenically frozen ancestor looks somewhere between a human and what they look like now because yeah. like clearly it's supposed to be that they have been cloned so many times that their genetic mm-hmm. tissue isn't what it used to be which right. is fine but they're like we can't say that they're also part human that wouldn't work so here's a humanoid thing that also still vaguely resembles the yeah asgard yeah it was a choice it was yeah just a choice i was thrown off by it um but they kept the lab in that galaxy to protect it from the replicators um so heimdall beams the two of them and their uh cryo man to the cargo ship and he and sam start prepping the ship to be able to power the stasis pod because at this point they don't know if they're going to get the other three out and eventually they are going to have to leave and she's like okay but like when you're done when we're done with this i do need to go back to the lab because i'm not ready to give up on jack and tilt yet like i Mm -hmm. I think they're still away um in the cell (laughs) jack and tilt are discussing their escape possibilities (laughs) And um, Jack's like, if Sam's smart, she'll have left already. And Teal'c's well, it's like, well, then our escape is negligible. And he goes, no, yes. we just have to do uh, and A plus lists, B plus C. And he <laughs> lists like four or five things that are incredibly impossible for them to do to get out yeah. of there. And it's like, we just have to do these things. And then Teal just goes, well, I stand corrected. Yeah. <laughs> um. But they have little to no hope. Um, 
But then, because Thor's mind is linked to the computer, he's like, hey, guys, um, here you go, and opens the cell. And he's yeah. like, but he's like, but also, um, I'm trapped. My, my brain is linked to the computer, and I'm only going to be able to keep them out for so long. Yeah. Like, he's like Sherlock mind palacing this shit, but, like, he's only going to be able to do it for a certain amount of time. And he's getting weaker, so he can't continue to communicate with them because that would use too much brain power. So um, they're at least out of the cell, but not much farther. They have no weapons and no idea where they are on the ship. Yep. But then, don't worry, Sam appears as a hologram and tells hello, and tells Jack and Teal that they can still make their plan work if. They, oh, if they remove some crystals from the central relay. Don't know what that means. Also yep. could not read that sentence. My handwriting was real bad there. Um, but then Ajafa calls Osiris and says that they're losing the battle with you and they need more help. So she sends all of the other ships away. So I briefly had a correct prediction because I, I thought I was going to hit all of the predictions. I was like, we got to talk about the Asgards. Maybe you will appear again. Who knows? Yeah. Almost, almost. Um, but we did see that you and Osiris are still fully at it and more. And since we all hate Osiris and Anubis, the number one most of all of the gods, we are still pretty much team you as our favorite gold. Which yep. <laughs> yep. Um, and then... And the fact that he's kicking their ass. Absolutely, my God. He was, like, on his last breath and was still killing them. Like, yeah. Um, one of the Java gliders that they sent down does locate the lab and begins to attack. So um, Sam is giving Teal and Jack directions. And she, like, meets them outside this access panel. And they're trying to figure out which is the correct crystal to pull when someone attacks Sam from behind and zaps her. And she passes out on the hollow bed. Very scary. Very, Very scary. scary. Um, we see that Osiris and all of her Jaffa are there in the lab. But like, I mean, I will say the one thing I will give Osiris credit for is that she does do her own dirty work. Like, it's That's not true. Like, like, it's not like Apophis where the number of times that we were dealing with Apophis, he wasn't even on the planet. We were dealing with his people. Yeah. Osiris was like, find it for me because I'm not going to go down there and dig through the dirt by right. myself. But once you find it, I will go take care of it. Like, I will mm -hmm. give her credit there. Um, so Jack and Teal attack some Jaffa um, and steal all their weapons. So they are not a weapon again. And Osiris asks she was like i have tilk and colonel o'neill now i have you so the only person that's missing is dr jackson and sam's like i got nothing for you so yeah. she tortures sam and um then we get a flash to jack and tilk deciding that they're not smart enough to decide which crystal is the right one to pull so they just okay. blow the whole fucking thing up but we can cut the right yellow wire on the battery but we can't pick the right colored crystal. There was no other option. Look, I mean, to be fair, I think that was the best choice was to oh. just shoot it all to hell. But <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. If that had been the only option, they would have done it. But Jack was like, we were only trying to pull the crystal because we had no weapons. Now I have a weapon. Let's yeah. fuck this up. Like, what are we yeah. doing? Um, and this so they lose for everyone now. Right. So they lose all the shields and they lose their ability to control the power in the main system so the ship mm -hmm. goes offline um after her first round of uh torture sam osiris is like i'm gonna ask you again where is daniel and sam's like he's dead and osiris you have a split second where sarah pops through and mm -hmm. is like not about this and then osiris is like i don't believe you yeah and tries to torture sam again but before she can do it sam gets a beamed out and Jack, Teal, and Thor all also get beamed out. And so everyone's on the cargo ship. And Thor's like, you can't take me with you. My brain is still linked to the computer. They're going to be able to follow us. Like, you have to leave me behind. And Jack's like, fuck that. We'll figure it out on the way. <laughs> and 
starts to leave anyway, but the, they're getting attacked by the mothership. And Anubis like is like, you have to surrender. And Jack's like, all right, we need a plan. Heimdall goes, we'll just have to destroy the ship ourselves. And Jack goes, how about a good plan? Right. How about not that? Um, I wrote Jack thinks, it, I said, which Jack thinks is the worst idea of all time. Um, but then as they're about to not know what to do in the most deus ex machinas of all of the deus ex machinas in this episode, um, <laughs> Freyr arrives and spooks the motherships. And is like, you, uh... JK, all of us are here now. Yeah, like, Fre Freyr and two other ships arrive, mm -hmm. and he's like, you already dealt with our worst ship. These are our new ships. Don't mess with us. Yeah. So Anubis is like, it is not worth it at this current moment. Mm -hmm. So they leave. Um... We do, then we have a quick briefing where we kind of get fill in all the background information that we need. Um, and in the briefing, they discuss that um, those three ships and Freya appearing show us that they made some headway with whatever they got from the Android. And they were at least able to like get a step up on the replicators to have mm -hmm. the ability to lose some ships for that situation. War is probably not done, but they're they're making sure they're making some some good progress. Um, and they did remove the device from Thor's head, but they have no idea still what that technology is or what to do with it or how to fix it. And so now Thor is in a potentially unrepairable coma. Great, excellent, love that. Um. Then we get a scene where everybody is getting ready to leave. Um, Tilk's wearing his weird gotta leave the base hat. Um, I forgot about this already. <laughs> and uh, Sam's like, oh, are you guys going home? And uh, Jack's like, no, actually, we're going to go gonna get something to eat. Do you want to come with us? And she's like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So the three of them go to get in the elevator together and a like got gust of wind passes them. And Sam's like, did you guys feel that? And Tilk's like, it's probably just like a fucked up ventilation, whatever. And yeah, Daniel and Jack goes, yeah, that's probably what it is. But then they get in the elevator and it goes again. And we just have a moment where Jack just like smiles to ghost Daniel by himself. And that is the end. Yes. Oh, Daniel Jackson. God so, bless. What did you think? I don't want to talk too much about what you think is coming yeah, because I want to do that next week when we talk about the whole of season five and what is going to happen for season six. But what did you, what did you think of the finale? Um, it was, I mean, it was actually really good. Um, I don't know what I think anyways right now, so I could talk about it if I wanted to, but <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I mean, I liked it. I thought it was a nice, a nice touch to have like ghost Daniel in the end. Um, yeah. I'm, pissed about thor but it's fine um because now jack has no besties i mean sure they're still they're saying like, whatever so but like stoke. but like they're not the same yeah. like now we have freya and is heimdall is that how you say his name heimdall like heimdall. um idris elba's character in the uh uh marvel thor heimdall mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Um, he is real fast with his beaming people up. Like, oh yeah, I'm interested to see. I know it's talking about the future, but like, that's all I could think. This episode was wow. He is faster than Thor at beaming people up. So who's to say where we're going? I mean, he's their scientific advisor. Like, he's fucking yeah. smart as shit. Yeah. Love so, it. um, I, it was fun being introduced to him, and he just he brought. I know that like all of the Asgardians have like this little bit of levity to him already, but he yeah. had, like a, a little bit more that was really yeah. fun. Um, so I really liked the introduction of him. Um, but yeah, it was it was a really good episode. I thought it was a really clean way to wrap up a season, which I don't always feel. Um, and I know they're switching networks, but yes, you know, sometimes that still doesn't matter. And sometimes mm -hmm. they switch because it's such a like terrible ending to it. So I was surprised by how yeah. cleanly wrapped up it was and how much we addressed from, you know, where we, just, we know where you is at. We know where the Asgards are. We know where Osiris is. Um, and it was different than the last episode, but still followed along really well with yeah. it. Like, 
So, so I'm they pleased. they did, and I like I said, most of my good trivia about the the season five, season six, the ending and everything, mm-hmm. I want to save till next week. But I will say yeah. they did know before they made this episode that they were leaving Showtime. And so they very deliberately, this is the first season that does not end in a cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. And they did that on purpose because they they want, oh, hello. Because they hoped that fans would follow them off of the network, but they didn't want to guarantee like to, that you had to. So they kind of wanted their Showtime fans to get a solid like button ending if that was their ending just in case just yeah just in case and i thought they did a really good job of yeah that. like they knew they were moving to sci-fi but they also were like what if people don't follow us what happens next still yeah. yes yeah and so i'll talk more about the the transition from showtime to sci-fi and what happened between seasons mm-hmm. and when all that that will be part a big chunk of our wrap up because that's the biggest change that we're going to talk about but that the the reason it's such a solid ending was because they knew that that was going to be mm-hmm. a thing um there some trivia uh imdb daniel is or michael shanks is still credited number two on the episode but it's the first time that he's listed as only as thor i hate it <laughs> um um and the picture of daniel on the desk in his office is not michael shanks it is a picture of james spader from the movie when they do the pan through his that. Yeah, when yeah. they do the pan through of his desk it's the picture of james spader on the weird camel thing from the movie oh i didn't even pay attention to that yeah so yeah. just a, what an homage. a little tribute to daniel mm-hmm. um in keeping with our fun, um, all of our Asgardians being voiced by people we already know, um, Heimdall is voiced by Terrell Rothery. Ooh. Um, oh, that's why I love him. And this is my favorite fun fact. Okay. Heimdall. So earlier I was talking about weird animatronic puppets. Um, and that is because up until this point, all of the Asgards were puppets. Heimdall right. is the first entirely CGI character ever on the show. Oh. Um, and in order to do that, they still, because at, up to this point, they had never done CGI. They'd only done prosthetics. Like they had some CGI, like yeah. tweakings of things, but the Unas, the Asgard, the, uh, like the, everything up until this point has been prosthetics. Even that weird mm-hmm. gray monster thing that Dion Johnstone was, mm-hmm. that was Lieutenant Tyler. So yeah the other actors and again we're talking 2002 the other actors are not talking to no one they don't they don't they're not prepped to talk to nothing to mm-hmm. act so Terrell rothery because she is the voice of heimdall and because she is short was asked to stand in like physically stand in for all of the heimdall stuff so she wore a stocking over her face um to keep her face able to be blurred out better and a bodysuit that had a painting of Heimdall on it with light up eyes where Heimdall's face would be so that they knew where to look to talk. The problem is Terrell Rothery is short, but Terrell Rothery is not Asgard short. (laughs) So Heimdall's eyeballs were on her boobs and so, so <laughs> there was a lot of really funny stories of the chaos that was Rick and Chris talking to Terrell's tits for the whole episode. <laughs> and like, luckily, this is such a close cast and they're all such yeah. good friends that like, it's just funny, awkward, not like sexual right. harassment, awkward. But like, there were a, quite a few times where they had to pause because Chris and Rick could not handle themselves trying to have a conversation with her boobs. That's so funny. Oh, God, <laughs> I love that. It's my favorite. And I was like looking at the one scene that it's really obvious is um there's a scene, one of the scenes with just Heimdall and, and Sam in the lab. And Amanda Tapping is 5'9". Mm-hmm. Terrell Rothery is 5'2". Mm-hmm. But the difference between Sam and Heimdall is very clearly not seven inches. Like it is, and I was just like watching it, being like, "Well, that is where Terrell Rothery's boobs are. That's where she lines up against Sam." Yep, um, that's so funny. So uh, love that. Yeah. So that's um, I have 
like I said, I have a lot more to talk about, but most of it is um, about how the season as a whole wraps and the production yeah. ends of switching seasons and switching networks. So um, for today, I think that's really all the trivia I have. Um, so who would you like to punch? So many times, so many times, Osiris. Like 112, like so many times. Yeah. Um, I am going to pick Sam, mostly because you already picked Osiris, but also because, like I've said before, I have a lot of issues with her character in this episode and the consistency of it. Mm -hmm. And not that I don't empathize with her and like feel for her and want better for her. I also I'm like, ma'am, you got a job to do. Yeah. You got a pet. You got a responsibility. That's my favorite movie. Um, anyway. <laughs> I really hope Brianna's listening to this episode because she will immediately have thought the same thing. Um, that I just did. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's why I'm going to pick Sam, even though, like, she's not the worst. Sure. She's no uh, Anubis. That's for sure. Yeah, but Anubis didn't do, I mean, he was scary, but he was, like, yeah. also really wasn't in it enough other than that one real fucking scary moment that... That's fair. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there will be more times to punch him. Plus, like, how oh, do you, I'm sure. Plus, like, how do you punch somebody in the face when they don't have a face? Oh, you find a way. Don't worry. Don't worry. I would find a way. I punch yeah. people all the time when they're dead. Like That's true. Same diff. Same diff. <laughs> all right. Who is your MVP? Um, you know, I think I'm gonna go Heimdall. Just because nice. God I love that character. Yeah. And I literally rewound that part like three times where you walk in and he's like, ah humans because i just laughed so hard Love and it. i understand that that is like not the biggest part of this episode but it's it cracked me up so much and mm -hmm. i just i like how smart he is and i liked i liked that he beamed so quickly everywhere yes so he was like on it um so. yeah i'm gonna pick um jack mm -hmm. because jack was not about to give up on thor and also just like that last moment at the end with Jack being the only one who really knew for sure that the wind was Daniel and like you getting to see that Jack cares. He's just grieving in Jack's way, not the way Sam wants him to. Right. You get that yeah. closure. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is my, my thing. I mean, I also... Probably could have done Thor because Thor was like, what the fuck are you guys doing? Oh, sure. <laughs> but, sure. Of <laughs> but, um, of course. Yeah. So uh, that is it. That is the end of season five oh. of Stargate. So next week will be our season five wrap up. Um, we've got. This was a really good season. It's a really so. good season. It's a good season. Um, a lot happened. Um, but yeah, we will. If you have any thoughts, theories, you have any discussion points you want to bring up for our total coverage of season five, do you have any um, segments that we've done in past season wrap ups that you enjoyed that you want to see again? Let us know. You can reach out to us at dothanaliens at gmail.com or on all of the social media at dothanaliens. You can follow me everywhere at E-M-K-A-Y underscore superstar. And you can find me at C-E Cloud 13. And we will see you on Thursday for a mind-blowing episode of Animal. What a day. <laughs> yeah. Bye.